Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Bhavna Sharma. I work as a medical registrar in the NHS London and this is your PLAB1 lecture series on the essentials of ECG. The topic that we'll cover on this session is atrial fibrillation. Now what we've done with teach you is that we've divided the ECG lectures into specific pathologies and ECG findings and their subsequent management because we feel that when we teach people the whole of ECG and we get in too much information into their mind they often get quite scared and quite alarmed that ECG might be something that they would struggle on but if you break that into absorbable chunks it often becomes easier for people to get in touch with the information a little bit better all right let's talk about atrial fibrillation now if you try and break down those two words they tell you the answer as to what they are atrial means that something is happening in the atria or the top part of the heart and fibrillation means small contractions okay so they're basically small tremors of the atria or of the right atrium actually and small contractions of them of both parts of the heart and chaotic electrical activity which is going to look on your ECG like what you see on the screen. Now usually in sinus rhythm you see easily identifiable atrial activity in the form of um, P waves but in the case of atrial fibrillation because the atria both the left and right atria are having um, chaotic small electrical activity so you'll see the same chaos on the ECG strip in the form of these fibrillatory potentials. Remember ECG is only an electrical representation of what's going, going on in the heart and because the P wave is lost or the left atrium and the right atrium's activity is lost in its beautiful form that we see the P wave we see these chaotic atrial fibrillation waves. So the first thing in an ECG if you can't see a P wave it's definitely atrial fibrillation. Okay that's done. Um, let's just talk about atrial fibrillation because it's a very easy ECG to identify. The questions which you find on your PLAB exam are often based not on identification but on management of atrial fibrillation. Before we discuss the management of atrial fibrillation, I just wanted to bring um, into picture the four different terms which might appear when you're talking about atrial fibrillation. Uh, the first thing that they might say is that it's a first detected episode of atrial fibrillation. Often we find in the hospitals when patients come in quite dehydrated or acutely unwell or septic they might present with atrial fibrillation which has not been known before and when you treat the underlying cause you treat the dehydration electrolyte abnormalities or sepsis the atrial fibrillation tends to resolve so if you find that ECG and a patient is acutely septic you treat the sepsis you don't really need to think about the atrial fibrillation until it's it's going to persist let's talk about situations where atrial fibrillation does get prolonged. Sometimes the patient might have something called a paroxysmal AF. So paroxysmal AF basically means that the AF comes and then it goes back. So the patient flips in between AF and sinus rhythm. So that's paroxysmal. Paroxysmal is an English term which means intermittent. So this is intermittent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Usually these last less than seven days and typically an episode of AF is less than 24 hours. If the arrhythmia is not self-terminating, so it doesn't really, the patient doesn't really flip back on its own, then we use the term persistent AF and persistent AF typically lasts greater than seven days. Permanent AF is someone that you cannot use a rhythm control strategy on or attempts to do rhythm crit control strategy are inappropriate or unsuccessful. And in these situations, you have to use rate control and anticoagulation. Don't get panicked about rate control and anticoagulation and rhythm control. I'm going to discuss that further. Permanent AF basically means that the 
patient has to or the doctor has to deal with the patient's AF and that's something which cannot be corrected. So four terms, first detected episodes, paroxysmal AF, persistent AF and permanent AF. These become very, very important when we talk about the management of AF. Now, if you can imagine, if you've got someone um, where there's chaotic electrical activity in the top part of the heart, so the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart. The top part of heart is contracting, but it's contracting very irregularly and it's not really contracting that well as a normal heart would. So you can imagine that's going to cause stasis of blood. So the blood flow from the top part of the heart to the bottom part of the heart won't really be rhythmic or it won't really be beautiful. So what's that going to create? That's going to create clogging up of blood in the top part of the heart. And that's what happens in AF. So you can imagine if there's clogging up of blood flow in the top part of the heart, then this patient might develop clots in the heart which might dislodge and go to the brain and that creates the need for anticoagulating patients with AF. So very very important step in management of AF is anticoagulation. Two things with anticoagulation is that you have to decide on anticoagulation in terms of the CHAS Chadzvac score and the Hasblad score. Now the Chadzvac score is basically something that you would definitely have to memorize for your PLAB1 exam. So Chadzvac, uh, the, the mnemonic expands. So C stands for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, A for age greater than 74, uh, which scores a 2 and age 65 to 74 scores a 1. Diabetes mellitus scores 1. Previous stroke slash TIA is 2. Vascular disease is 1 and female is 1. Earlier, what the guidelines were that if a patient scores 1 and they're a male or they're a female and they score a 2. So remember the female, it costs you 1 point as it is. So what they used to say, if that a female scores 2 points and a male scores 1 point, you give them aspirin and if they're more than 2 points, you give them warfarin or apixaban. The guidelines have actually changed and the NICE guidelines now recommend that anyone who's got AF and is scoring greater than a zero, you should offer them anticoagulation. And the shift has been from warfarin. So earlier we used to prefer warfarin a lot. But the problem with warfarin is that when you give this for anticoagulation to a patient, um, you have to call them up for regular blood tests um, to the hospital. Um, so that sometimes patients find that quite annoying. So now there's been a shift to the no Noel oral anticoagulants like Epixaban, Rivaroxaban, Edoxaban, which patients prefer. One thing that you need to warn the patients, especially when they're being switched from warf uh, switched from warfarin to Epixaban or you're offering them Epixaban or any other novel anticoagulant is that there is no uh, reversibility to a Pixaban. So if a patient does suffer from a bleed due to a Pixaban, although the risk of bleed is much lesser compared to warfarin, in warfarin you can give the patient vitamin K and reverse effects in a Pixaban, Rivaroxaban. You don't really have like a proper anticoagulant. You have some which are in research and they, the NICE guidelines are still a little unclear about that, but vitamin K and warfarin is well established. So that's something that you might want to tell their patient. Okay, now that you've decided on anticoagulating the patient, you need to also consider a Hasbled score. So Hasbled, like the name states, is the risk factors that the patient might have bleeding from anticoagulation. Especially if a patient is someone who's having recurrent falls, they're an alcoholic, they're hypertensive, um, then this patient, what you might do is by giving this patient warfarin for their AF, you might create more harm than, because the patient might have a fall at home and might have a life-threatening or a lethal bleed. So now what the NICE guidelines tell us that when you're considering a patient for anticoagulation, you consider both Chadvask and Hasbled score. There are actually online apps which make you decide in between the risk. So this is a little bit of an introduction to anticoagulation in AF. So that's just going to prevent the risk of stroke. That's not really going to correct your AF.
the thing which is going to correct or control the AF are two things you can either do a rate control or a rhythm control so rate control basically means that the patient is going very very fast they are in AF their heart is beating at a speed of 150 you slow it down to 80 but they still remain in AF rhythm control means that the patient was running at a rate of 150 in AF you flip that into sinus rhythm so you make that you correct the AF or you make that AF sinus rhythm and the P wave comes back when you do rhythm control Drugs for both vary. Um, in rate control, you're thinking about things like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Guys, remember if a patient has asthma, you don't give them beta blockers because that's going to create a spasm of the bronchioles and it's going to exacerbate the symptoms of asthma. So you give them calcium channel blockers and things which we use for rhythm control. The big player in this is amiodarone. Make sure that you know the side effects of amiodarone for your PLAB1 exam. Now, how do you decide whether you want to give this patient rate control versus rhythm control? Rate control is generally something that we use for patients who've got a long history of AF and the AF hasn't really been controlled. So you compromise by offering the patients rate control. Generally, older patients greater than 65, we prefer rate control versus rhythm control because rhythm control, the drugs have a lot of side effects. So you compromise by giving them rate control in that state um, when patients have heart failure which gets worse with atrial fibrillation you want to correct the heart failure so you want to correct the af and that would make rhythm control a preferred strategy and of course the most important factor in deciding rate control versus rhythm control is patient preference some people don't really like beta blockers because they are associated with a lot of fatigue and a lot of um, non-specific symptoms of uh, them not them having reduced exercise tolerance so they don't really want to take beta blockers so then you have to think about other strategies so rate control is going to slow down the heart and rhythm control is going to stop the heart from going into af Two more strategies that you want to know about uh, for your PLAB1 exam which might be used in AF. So there's something called an unstable AF. So the patient might have a high, high heart rate and they might not have symptoms from it. So symptoms which would alarm you that this is a patient who's unstable and they are peri-arrest. You need to correct their AF very fast is if they have a lot of symptoms. They're getting short of breath. They are having chest pain or they've got symptoms of heart failure or a low blood pressure that's going to alarm you that this af means that the patient isn't getting enough blood into the peripheries so it's an ischemic state for the patient it's a very dangerous state for the patient in these stages we might offer the patient cardioversion which is often used um, if you've studied for your als or you've studied for um, ACLS you might form uh, you might find unstable um, AF in one of your protocols cardioversion is something that we do use remember the success rate isn't really 100% it's about 50% uh, per cardioversion attempt so it's basically similar to what you do in VF or pulseless VT you shock the heart and try to get it back to the sinus rhythm sometimes we do plan a cardio version for a patient so a patient is planned to have a cardio version they have af which is quite disabling for, for them and we're not really able to correct it with medications then we call the patient um, into um, a cath lab and do a dc cardio version a controlled dc cardio version on them and then we give them our 100 joules of energy and increase it in increments up to 400 but what you need to remember is that if you're doing that for a patient you need to make sure that they're anticoagulated for a period before doing the dc cardio version otherwise what you might do is that there might be clots in the heart which you dislodge by um, giving the shock to the heart and that might cause a stroke for the patient and create lots of problems so make sure that you anticoagulate the patient some labs say that they want two weeks of anticoagulation prior to attempting a dc cardio version another new strategy 
um, not really new but something which has been tried is catheter ablation for AF. Uh, so the left atrial appendage is one which is targeted by cryotherapy or a radio frequency current generator which basically ablates the AF uh, generating focus and it helps patient revert back into their sinus rhythm. So two new strategies. You just need to know their names for the PLAB1 exam and that's it, you're done. So the things that you need to remember about AF is what it looks like on an ECG, what strategies you're going to use to correct it and what new techniques are being used for AF. That's it. We're done with AF. I hope that solved a lot of your ECG problems. We'll be discussing atrial flutter in the next lecture. Please subscribe and stay tuned for our further lectures. Good luck.